Welcome. This is Radio Pras. Hello, everybody. This one is a, a an English piece by James Thurber. The uh, the title is University Days. University Days by James Thurber. This this was done uh, during the 30s, so the, the timing is pretty important. It's 1933 is when this got released. So, University Days by James Thurber. I passed all the other courses that I took at my university, but I could never pass botany. This was because all botany students had to spend several hours a week in a laboratory looking through a microscope at plant cells, and I could never see through a microscope. I never once saw a cell through a microscope. This used to enrage my instructor. He would wander around the laboratory, pleased with the progress all the students were making in drawing the involved and, and so I'm told, interesting structure of flower cells until he came to me. I would just be standing there. I can't see anything, I would say. He would begin patiently enough, explaining how anybody can see through a microscope, but he would always end up in a fury, claiming that I could too see through a microscope, but I just pretended that I couldn't. It takes away from the beauty of the flowers anyway, I used to tell him. We are not concerned with beauty in this course, he would say. We are concerned solely with what I might call the mechanics of flowers. Well, I'd say, I can't see anything. Try it just once again, he'd say, and I would put my eye into the microscope and see nothing at all, except now and again a nebulous, milky substance, a phenomenon of maladjustment. You are supposed to see a vivid, restless clockwork of sharply defined plant cells. I see what looks like a lot of milk, I would tell him. This, he claimed, was a result of my not having adjusted the microscope properly, so he would readjust it, uh, readjust it for me, or rather for himself, and I would look again and see milk. I finally took a deferred pass, as they call it, and, and waited a year and tried again. You had to pass at least one of the biological sciences or you couldn't graduate. The professor had, came back, uh, had come back from vacation, brown as a berry, bright-eyed, and eager to explain cell structure again to his classes. Well, he said to me cheerily when we met in the first laboratory hour of the semester, we're going to see cells this time, aren't we? Uh, yes, sir, I said. Students to right of me and to the left of me and in front of me were seeing cells. What's more, they were quietly drawing pictures of them in their notebooks. Of course, I didn't see anything. We'll try it, the professor said to me grimly. With every adjustment of the microscope known to man, as God is my witness, I'll arrange this glass so that you could see cells through it or I'll give up teaching. In 22 years of botany, I... He cut off abruptly, for he was beginning to quiver all over like Lionel Barrymore, and he genuinely wished to hold on to his temper. His scenes with me had taken a great deal out of him. So, so we, we tried again. We tried it with every adjustment of the microscope known to man. With only one of them did I see anything but blackness or the familiar lacteal opacity. And that time I saw, to my pleasure and amazement, a variegated constellation of flecks, specks, and dots. These I hastily drew. The instructor, noting my activity, came back from an adjoining desk, a smile on his lips and his eyebrows high in hope. He looked at my cell drawing. What's that? He demanded with a hint of squeal in his voice. Oh, that's what I saw, I said. You did it! You did it! You did it! He screamed, losing control of his temper instantly, and he bent over and squinted into the microscope. His head snapped up. That's your eye, he shouted. You fixed the lens so that it reflects. You've drawn your eye. Another course that I didn't like, but somehow managed to pass, was economics. I went to that class, straight from the botany class, which didn't help me any in understanding either subject. I used to get them mixed up, but not as mixed up as another student in my economics class who came from there direct from a physics laboratory. He was a tackle on the football team named Bolashishwicks. At that time, Ohio State University had one of the best football teams in the country, and the Bolasheviks was one of its outstanding stars. In order to be eligible to play, it was necessary for him to keep, it, keep up in his studies, a very difficult matter, for while he was not dumber than an ox, he was not any smarter. 
most of his professors were lenient and helped him along. None gave him uh, more hints in answering questions or asked him simpler ones than the economics professor, a thin, timid man named Bassam. One day when we were on the subject of transportation and distribution, it came Bolo Bolensheviks turn to answer a question. Name one means of transportation, the professor asked to him, uh, said to him. No light came to this big tackle's eyes. Just um, any means of transportation, said the professor. Bolshev is still staring at him. That is, pursued the professor, any medium, agency, or method of going from one place to another. Bolsheviks had the look of a man who's being led into a trap. You may choose among steam, horse-drawn, or electrically propelled vehicles, said the instructor. I might suggest, well, I might suggest the one which we commonly take in making long journeys across land. There was a profound silence in which everybody stirred uneasily, including Bolsheviks and Mr. Bassam. Mr. Bassam abruptly broke the silence in an amazing manner. Choo-choo, choo-choo, he said in a low voice and turned instantly scarlet. He glanced appealingly around the room. All of us, of course, shared Mr. Bassam's desire that Bolsheviks should stay abreast of the class in economics. For the Illinois game, one of the hardest and most important of the season, was only a week off. Toot, 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 some student with a deep voice moaned, and we all looked encouragingly at Bolsheviks. Somebody else gave a fine imitation of a locomotive letting off steam. Mr. Bassam himself rounded off the little show. Ding dong, ding dong, he said hopefully. Bolsheviks was staring at the floor now, trying to think. His great brow furrowed, his huge hands rubbing together, his face red. How did you come to college this year, Mr. Bolsheviks? asked the professor. Chaffa, 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 chaffa. My father sent me, said the football player. What on? asked Bassam. I get an allowance, said the tackle, in a low, husky voice, obviously embarrassed. No, no, said Bassam. Name a means of transportation. What did you ride here on? Train, said Bolenshuis. Quite right, said the professor. Now, Mr. Nugent, will you tell us? If I went through anguish and botany and economics, for different reasons, gymnasium work was even worse. I don't even like to think about it. They wouldn't let you play games or join in the exercises with your glasses on, and I, I couldn't see with mine off. I, I, I bumped into professors, horizontal bars, agricultural students, and swinging iron rings. Not being able to see, I could take it, but I couldn't dish it out. Also, in order to pass gymnasium, and you had to pass it to graduate, you had to learn to swim, and if you didn't know how. I didn't like swimming pool, I didn't like swimming, and I didn't like the swimming instructor. After all these years, I still don't. I never swam, but I passed my gym work anyway by having another student give my gymnasium number, 978, and swim across the pool in my place. He was a quiet, amiable blonde youth, number 473, and he would have seen through a microscope for me if, if he could have gotten away with it, but we couldn't get away with it. Another thing I didn't like about uh, gymnasium work was that they made you strip the day you registered. It is impossible for me to be happy when I'm stripped and being asked a lot of questions. Still I, still I did better than a lanky agricultural student who was cross-examined just before I was. They asked each student what college he's in. That is, you know, whether arts or engineering or commerce or agriculture. What college are you in? The instructor snapped at the youth in front of me. Ohio State University. He said promptly. <laughs> it wasn't that uh, agricultural student, but it was another, uh, a whole lot like him who decided to take up journalism, possibly on the ground that when farming went to hell, he could fall back on newspaper work. He didn't realize, of course, that um, that would be very much like falling back full length on a kit of carpenter's tools. Haskins didn't seem cut out for journalism, being too embarrassed to uh, talk to anybody and unable to use a typewriter. But the editor of the college paper assigned him to the cow barns, the sheep house, the horse pavilion, and the animal husbandry department generally. This was a genuinely big beat, for it took up uh, five times as much ground and got ten times as great a legislative appropriation at the, as the College of Liberal Arts. The uh, agricultural student knew animals, 
but nevertheless his stories were dull and colorlessly written. He took all afternoon on each of them on account of having to hunt for each letter on the typewriter. Once in a while, he had to ask somebody to help him hunt. C and L in particular were hard letters for him to find. His editor finally got pretty much annoyed at the farmer journalist because his pieces were so uninteresting. See here, Haskins. He snapped at him one day. Why is it we never have anything hot from you on the horse pavilion? Here we have 200 head of horses on this campus, more than any other university in the Western Conference except Purdue, and yet you never get any real lowdown on them. Now, shoot over to the horse barns and dig up something lively. Haskins shambled out and came back in about an hour. He said he had something. Well, start it off snappily, said the editor. Something people will read. Haskins set to work and in a couple of hours brought a sheet of typewritten paper to the desk. It was a 200-word story about some disease that had broken out among the horses. Its opening sentence was simple but arresting. It read, Who has noticed the source on the tops of the horses in the animal husbandry building? <laughs> Ohio State was a land grand university and therefore two years of military drill was compulsory. We drilled with old Springfield rifles and studied the tactics of civil war, even though the world war was going on at that time. At 11 o'clock each morning, thousands of freshmen and sophomores used to deploy over the campus, moodily creeping up on the old chemistry building. It was a good training for the kind of warfare that was waged at Shiloh, but it had no connection with what was going on in Europe. Some people used to think there was German money behind it, but they didn't dare say so or they would have been thrown in jail as German spies. It was a, a period of muddy thought and marked, I believe, the decline of higher education in the Middle West. As a soldier, I was never any good at all. Um, most of the cadets were glumly indifferent soldiers, but I was no good at all. Once General Littlefield, who was commandant of the cadet corps, popped up in front of me during regimental drill and snapped, you are the main trouble with this university. I think he meant that my type was the main trouble with the university, but he may have meant me individually. I was mediocre at drill. Certainly, that is until my senior year. By the time I had drilled longer than anybody else in the Western Conference, having failed at military at the end of each preceding year so that I had to do it all over again. I was the only senior still in uniform. The uniform which, when new, had made me look like an interurban railway conductor, now that it had become faded and too tight, made me look like Bert Williams in his bellboy act. This had a definitely bad effect on my morale. Even so, I had become, by sheer practice, little short of wonderful at squad maneuvers. One day, General Littlefield picked our company out for the whole regiment and tried to get it mixed up by putting it through one movement after another as fast as we could execute them. Squads right, squads left, squad on right onto light, squads right about, squads left front into light, etc. In about three minutes, 109 men were marching in, marching in one direction and I was marching away from them at an angle of 40 degrees, all alone. Company halt, shouted General Littlefield. That man is the only man who has it right. I was made a corporal for my achievement. The next day, General Littlefield summoned me to his office. He was swatting flies when I went in. I was silent. He was silent too for a long time. I don't think he remembered me or why he had sent for me, but he didn't want to admit it. He swatted some more flies, keeping his eyes on them narrowly before he let go with the swatter. Button up your coat, he snapped. Looking back on it now, I can see that he meant me, although he was looking at a fly, but I just stood there. Another fly came to rest on a paper in front of the general and began rubbing its hind legs together. The general lifted the swatter cautiously. I moved restlessly and the fly flew away. You startled him, barked General Littlefield, looking at me severely. I said I was sorry. That won't help the situation, snapped the general with cold military logic. I didn't see what I could do except offer to chase some more flies towards his desk, <laughs> but I didn't say anything. He stared out the window at the faraway figures of coeds crossing the campus towards the library. Finally, he told me I could go, so I went. He either didn't know which cadet I was or else 
he forgot what he wanted to see me about. It may have been that he wished to apologize for having called me the main trouble with the university, or maybe he had decided to compliment me on my brilliant drilling of the day before, and then at the last moment decided not to. I don't know. I don't think about it much anymore. The end.